Hello, good trinaries, and welcome to a very special episode of Truth or Myth, a Star Trek web series that looks at the truth or canon information in an effort to dispel the myths that have surfaced on any given topic. Well, today's episode is a special one. You see, for my Backtrack series, I've been knee-deep in all the information on Star Trek V The Final Frontier, and I have to tell you, that process was grueling. As you can imagine, I was in need of a little fun when it came to this box office flop, so I thought I'd repost an older video I had made of the mistakes contained within that film. So what you're about to see is a video I made a long, long time ago, close to the start of the channel, where in good fun, I pointed out what I saw as mistakes canonically in that movie. I've cleaned it up a bit, but essentially it is the original version of the video I had released back then in the day, and so it isn't perfect. For example, the audio is from a time before I knew what a good microphone actually was, and before I had really nailed down my personal style when it came to video editing, so please forgive me on those points. Now there are some of you out there that don't understand that these videos are only in fun. They in no way are an attempt to degrade the movie or to tick people off who do love Star Trek V. They are simply done in the spirit of my love for Star Trek, and designed to start imaginative discussions to explain away the mistakes that are found. Just a little reminder though, if you do want to explain away any of the mistakes in this video, then it has to be within universe canon explanations only. So novels, video games, tech manuals, and that guy that you're behind at a stop sign that is texting and often never never land while you're simply just trying to get home after work are not valid sources to explain away the mistakes. But don't be fooled into thinking that it will be an easy task to change my mind about any of them. I've thoroughly researched each one and considered all the options to explain them away that I could come up with. And these are the mistakes that are left standing. But I do look forward to hearing all of your theories. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. One of the major nitpicks with this movie is the Enterprise herself. At the end of Star Trek IV, we see a bright, white bridge interior with consoles that are smooth-faced, but look like the ones in the previous three movies. However, in this movie, suddenly the interior is beige-based in color, and looks more like the original series with all the consoles being connected around the bridge. So what exactly happened between the films? As a side note, the real reason for these changes was simple neglect. The bridge sets from Star Trek IV were left outside during a rainstorm and were completely destroyed, so new, changed sets were built. This movie suffers from the same illogical plot devices that we've seen in previous movies. The Admiral tells Kirk that he needs Jim Kirk to take on this mission to rescue the hostages from Nimbus 3. With all due respect, the Enterprise is a disaster. There must be other ships in the quadrant. Other ships, yes. But no experienced commanders. Captain, I need Jim Kirk. Since apparently no other Starfleet captain could deal with it. Okay, I can accept that Starfleet wants that. However, why send Kirk on the Enterprise? The Enterprise herself is in really bad shape, so much so that even half the doors won't open. Does that seem like a good ship to send on this mission? Especially since the Excelsior is in space dock right beside the Enterprise. Or at the very least there must be another starship in interception range of the Enterprise that Kirk could take command of. And to top it all off, the Enterprise has only a skeleton crew. Why? Couldn't they have borrowed officers from the Excelsior to fill in the crew temporarily? At the beginning of the movie, Homeless Man exclaims that Cybok is a Vulcan. You're a Vulcan? Why exactly does he think that? Wouldn't it have been more logical to assume that the emotion-filled Vulcan was actually a Romulan? How exactly does Spock's rocket boots work anyhow? They seem to defy the laws of physics in this movie. They have rockets on the bottom, yet seem to be able to hold a person upside down. During the marshmallow scene, watch the marshmallow sticks as they jump around all throughout this scene. 
Starfleet must not have much faith in its log recorder book. A rather large screen on the book itself is etched with a system failure notice. Does this happen a lot? Why does Cybok imprison the hostages in a place where they could have easily been beamed out of? After all, couldn't a normally functioning starship have pinpointed the hostages' life signs and simply beamed them out? Where exactly did Uhura pull out the palm ferns from to do her naked sand dance? Remember how the Admiral said he needed Jim Kirk for this mission? Captain, I need Jim Kirk. Well, Kirk doesn't show the reason why in this movie. Well, on the planet, why doesn't Kirk order wide stun during the rescue scene? See Return of the Archons. When the Klingons are closing on the Enterprise, Claw orders his ship to impulse power. Yet, the outside space shot shows the ship stays at warp. During the shuttle crash scene, watch the shuttle bay doors. One angle shows they're closed, then suddenly, they're wide open. After outwitting the Klingons, Kirk and Cybok have a fight in the shuttle bay. During the scuffle, Spock picks up the pebble gun and Kirk orders him to fire the gun. Spock, however, does not. Then later, Spock explains that if he had, Cybok would be dead. How exactly is that true? Sure, he may have died without medical attention, but where Spock would have shot him was where the human heart resides. Assuming the pebble gun would pierce through to a human heart, then yes, that person would die. However, Cybok is Vulcan, and Vulcan hearts are on the left wall of the chest cavity. See Mud's Women and A Private Little War. Another Enterprise nitpick here. Suddenly, the decks are numbered, not lettered like in the previous films, and appear to be numbered from the bottom of the ship to the top of the ship. It also seems that the brig is on the bottom, on the secondary hull, deck 1, and the bridge is on the top, deck 78. That's right, suddenly not only can you get from the secondary hull to the bridge in the saucer section without any horizontal tubes, but the Enterprise has at least 78 decks. Even though, if you count the windows on the outside, this could not be true. Maybe Starfleet borrowed the bigger on the inside tech from Star Trek Enterprise. Also, the rocketing up scene is screwy. Watch the deck numbers as they propel up through the shaft. The numbers do not go in succession and repeat themselves. How exactly did the Enterprise get to the center of the galaxy so quickly? In less than a day, she got from Earth to Nimbus 3 and then to the galactic center. That's amazing! especially considering that Voyager was originally going to take 75 years to get home. It should have only taken Janeway a week at most to do this, according to this movie. When God took control of the shuttlecraft, why did he park it so far away from where he would appear? Is that logical? Or maybe he just has a flair for the dramatics. During the long walk to God scene, Kirk and crew's images are transmitted to the Enterprise. But who exactly is sending these images? If it's God himself, then why does no one ever comment on that? If it's some sort of tech, why don't we see anyone activating it? Never once does the audience see said tech in long shots. When Kirk questions God about wanting a starship, God lashes out and Kirk is hit with a bolt of energy. Excuse me, I'd just like to ask a question. Then here is the proof you see. Why isn't Kirk dead? If you look at Kirk's uniform, both the front and back are singed. This would have killed him instantly. Hmm, maybe he really is God. Speaking of God, who exactly imprisoned him there? Just a thought, but perhaps the beings from the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Nth Degree? Photon torpedoes must not be as destructive as we have always been led to believe. Having fired directly at God's house, there are still pillars standing, and Kirk and crew are just fine even though they're fairly close by. Shouldn't Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and the God pillars have been incinerated, and only a deep hole be left in their place? The Enterprise A's transporter room looks familiar, doesn't it? I guess transporters haven't advanced that much since they appear very similar to the transporter rooms on the Enterprise-D. 
Wow, what a huge blast from the past. But sometimes it's nice to see where you've come from to realize where you're going. And thank you all so much for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth. Have an explanation for any of the mistakes I've listed here in this video? Or did you see one I've missed? Well, leave a comment in the section below. Also, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel out correcting its own mistakes? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.